I am Lucy Perez, a senior partner with McKinsey and & Company and co-leader of McKinsey's Health Institute. And it gives me great pleasure to be here with all of you to moderate this important conversation. Lead, with its pervasive presence, poses serious threats to our people and to the environment and to our collective well-being. I'm looking forward to the conversation today with these three wonderful speakers. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency, Prime Minister Irakli Garibashvili of Georgia, um, the Honorable Mudrik Saraga, Minister for State for Labor, Economic Affairs, and Investment of Tanzania, and Administrator Samantha Power of the U.S. Agency for International Development. We will hear some opening remarks first from Administrator Power before we'll start a conversation with the panelists. There will be time at the end for open Q&A with the audience, so I encourage you to think through what questions you may have for this group. Let me, with that note, turn the floor over to you, Administrator Power. Uh, thank you, uh, Lucy, for that introduction, and really a special thanks um, to Prime Minister Gary Bashvili of Georgia, whose efforts uh, to treat and to prevent lead exposure have cut uh, blood lead levels in the country's hardest hit regions by two thirds in just five years. Um, really looking forward, Mr. Prime Minister, to hearing your account of, of how you achieved uh, that measurable success. Um, and Minister Saraga from Tanzania, whose country was the first in East Africa to regulate lead paint and with whom we're looking forward to working uh, on the ground uh, to expand the impact of those regulatory efforts. Um, first, just maybe a, a personal reflection on this panel. Um, I have spent my career um, first as a journalist and as a human rights activist and as a government official and diplomat uh, looking for ways uh, to promote and, and protect human rights and to try, especially while at USAID, uh, to improve and even, if we can, save lives uh, around the world. I can say right here that never in my career have I seen an opportunity like the one we are about to discuss to deliver such a powerful blow to such an invisible killer for such a relatively small amount of funding. And I'm speaking, of course, we're speaking about lead poisoning. Uh, the world can make a really substantial dent in lead exposure for less than it costs to make the last movie you saw. Lead poisoning claims a staggering 1.6 million lives each year. That's more than the deaths caused by malaria and HIV AIDS combined. One would expect that such a staggering human cost would garner major international attention and resources. Yet, the total investment from international donors in taking on this crisis is just $15 million at present. That is million with an M, million. If all we do coming out of today, and I really want to send a special uh, welcome and thanks to all the people who are watching online, if all we do together is begin the final push, for example, to eliminate lead in consumer goods, if all we do uh, is begin to harness the power of our networks and commit just a fraction of our annual budgets to this cause, we have the chance to prevent brain damage for hundreds of millions of children, and every year, potentially, to save hundreds of thousands of lives. Perhaps no one can better understand the urgency of addressing the lead crisis than parents. For decades, lead has poisoned kids in their classrooms, their bedrooms, their playgrounds. Lead lurks in the food that kids eat, the water they drink, the medicines they take, and of course the paint brightening their bedroom walls and the toys that are helping them learn and grow. Until very recently, lead laced the gasoline powering their family cars, and it spewed out of exhaust pipes into the air that they breathed. 
Lead is particularly harmful to children, but there is no safe amount of lead for anyone. Imagine if a single sugar packet filled with lead dust was sprinkled across an American football field. So think of the scale of the football field and the tiny little packet of sugar. What comes out of that packet would be enough lead to poison a child playing there. And once in the body, lead can threaten almost every major organ, wreaking special havoc on the heart and the brain. Signs of exposure are often difficult to attribute. Cognitive deficits might be ascribed to poor education, and even deaths are attributed to heart attacks or strokes rather than the lead poisoning that caused them. Yet for a problem that is so omnipresent, so invisible, so deadly, the key policy response is actually straightforward. Eliminate lead at its source before it reaches communities. That, of course, as we all know, is what happened before. In the 1970s, when government officials and activists tackled one of the largest sources of lead, gasoline. By the turn of this century, industrialized countries from Japan to the United States had implemented total bans on lead additives. Over the following two decades, a UN-led campaign helped achieve the same result throughout the rest of the world. It's an incredible, insufficiently told success story. They spent just $6 million in 10 years and that period covered the phase out of leaded gasoline in all of Sub-Saharan Africa and every remaining holdout except for four countries. Leaded gasoline was one of those rare public health threats, wide ranging and deadly, yes, but also eminently solvable. And the impact has been tremendous. Every year, the ban on leaded gasoline saves roughly 1.2 million lives. Higher income countries like the US went on to ban lead additives in other products like house paint and water pipes. Starting in 1978, blood lead levels throughout the US dropped 60% within 10 years and 95% within 25 years. Today, President Biden is making historic additional investments, this time in the replacement of lead water lines, the removal of lead-based paint in older buildings, and the cleanup of lead deposits in soil. But in many low and middle-income countries, there is still very little regulation of lead in products beyond gas, and often no enforcement or too little enforcement to ensure that regulations are being followed. So today, one in two children in these countries has elevated levels of lead in their blood. That is every other student in a classroom, every other child kicking a soccer ball on a field. Lead causes learning disabilities and educational performance gaps estimated to cost the global economy at least a trillion dollars every year. Fortunately, and again, looking ahead, there is a lot of good news for us to seize upon. The successful phase out of gasoline and other products has given us a straightforward, proven playbook to take on this crisis. First, conduct regular blood and market testing, and ideally blood lead level testing to identify exposure and trace exposure back to the source. Second, pass binding controls to phase out lead in specific products and industries. Third, where needed, support the private sector to transition to lead free and often, and this is key, cost comparable alternatives. <clears throat> Those cost comparable alternatives are out there and accessible. They just have to be seized upon. And finally, enforce and ensure that regulations are being followed. This playbook is broadly applicable, but it is especially efficient and affordable 
to implement one slice of this problem, and that is that which relates to consumer products, paint, spices, and cosmetics. So we are also supporting the advocacy needed to pass and enforce new regulations to phase, phase out lead in these products. That is why I'm delighted here today at the World Economic Forum to announce that USAID is the world's first bilateral donor agency to join the Global Alliance to Eliminate Lead Paint. The Alliance has helped ban leaded paint in almost 40 countries, more than a third of all nations that have bans. Joining the Alliance can give our teams on the ground the support they need to assist our government partners in passing similar policies. The process to phase out lead from consumer products is often incredibly cheap. In 2019, for example, Bangladeshi researchers discovered that turmeric was a primary cause of high blood lead levels. Government officials launched an aggressive media campaign to inform the public about the dangers of lead and followed up with impromptu testing of turmeric to identify which shops were selling leaded products. Within two years, just two years, the percentage of turmeric samples containing lead dropped from 47% to zero. And the cost of the entire effort from start to finish was in the low millions. Now, not all efforts to prevent the release of lead into the environment will be so cost effective. Preventing lead pollution in industries like mining and manufacturing, replacing infrastructure like old lead pipes, cleaning up contaminated soil and water, that's of course going to require more resources. But that is why it is so important to give countries the tools and the support that they need to identify what for them are the biggest sources of lead exposure so that they know where best to concentrate resources to eliminate lead. I'm pleased to announce here today that USAID is committing an initial $4 million toward identifying and addressing common sources of lead exposure in low and middle income countries, including blood testing and sampling initiatives. That money is going to fund pilot programs in India and South Africa focused on lead mitigation, while also supporting UNICEF as they work to expand blood testing nationwide to Bangladeshi children. Today though, the reason we are here and doing this at the World Economic Forum is to make an appeal to donors of all kinds, governmental donors, uh, other international funders, diaspora uh, donors, high net worth individuals to join us. Join us in building up testing capacity. Join us in helping countries identify the source of the problem best apply their resources to take it on or reinforce those resources where we need to and see that those efforts are making a, a measurable difference, finding ways to see the impact of specific interventions. So many of the challenges that we face that are being discussed in other rooms that are being discussed all around the world that are searing our consciences as we are here today are entrenched, they are complicated, they are hard to solve. Lead is different. According to the Center for Global Development, we can eliminate lead from two critical consumer sources, paint and spices, for just $30 million. That is the cost of a private jet. To be clear, there are other consumer goods that we absolutely have to tackle together, but the cost there too will be comparable. For a small price, we can spare parents of living the nightmare of seeing their kids poisoned in the places where they're supposed to be safe. We can help prevent cardiac deaths in men and women too young to die. And we can help kids under five safely learn and grow to their fullest potential if we simply choose to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Administrator Power. Those are powerful words. It is clear that lead poisoning is a health crisis, is an economic productivity and attainment crisis, it's also an education crisis. It is helpful to hear of the playbook and the tools that are available and can drive change. 
administrator power referenced the success of Georgia. And so, Prime Minister, would love to hear you elaborate on what was Georgia's journey and how you made that change happen. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I want to express my gratitude to USA Administrator, Madam Power, and dear friends and colleagues. Thank you very much for inviting us uh, to highlight Georgia's success story. Um, I also want to <coughs> mention that lead poisoning stands out as one of the most pressing public health challenges in the world. It is also crucial to recognize that this challenge extends beyond Georgia and other countries. It is a, it is a global issue. Uh, recent reports highlight that an estimated one in three children worldwide suffers from lead poisoning due to exposure to common sources like paints, informal battery, recycling centers, cookware, cosmetics, and in some instances, spices, as was mentioned. Also, it is crucial to understand that uh, lead poisoning contributes to nearly 1.5% of annual global deaths and poses severe risks, uh, especially to children and pregnant women in low- and middle-income countries. As for Georgia's success story, first of all, multiple indicator cluster surveys conducted in, uh, in our country in 2018 by UNICEF with support from USAID revealed that 41% of children aged between two and seven years had blood uh, lead levels above an unacceptable uh, threshold. These data triggered immediate action by the government. We swiftly initiated relevant steps aimed at mitigating and preventing lead poisoning in the country. The national response package launched in 2019 with support from UNICEF and USAID, including the wide-scale awareness campaign, lead biomonitoring among children and pregnant women, establishment of the chemical risk factor laboratory, and development of a lead surveillance system to monitor blood lead levels and identify sources of exposure. In order to identify the sources of exposure, we have started the assessment of environmental conditions within the same program. These interventions result in speed improvements indicating the effectiveness of the response package. At the fourth year of the lead response surveillance program implementation, we have observed a remarkable 75% decrease in the prevalence of blood lead levels among children in the region uh, with the highest initial prevalence. In order to sustain uh, these achievements, Georgia has bolstered the regulatory framework concerning the lead-containing uh, products. Uh, aligned with the EU association agreement since July 2023, we have implemented string, strict uh, technical regulations uh, controlling the manufacture, uh, sale, and import of construction paints. Uh, legal limits have been set to govern the production, sale, and import of paint with higher lead concentrations. Additionally, to address potential risk, Georgia has enhanced its regulatory framework uh, concerning lead mi migration in toys. Relevant regulation in force uh, since 2021, uh, focuses on ensuring the safety of toys, incorporating legal limits to govern the production, sale, and import of toys with high lead migration. We are also actively working on establishing uh, government regulations to ensure the safety of these products, uh, aligning with EU legislation and following WHO recommendations. In order to improve the ambient air quality monitoring in the country, we have started continuous 24 by 7 a sampling and analysis of heavy metals, including the content of lead in major cities. <coughs> the current results show that ambient uh, air pollution may not be considered as a source of lead exposure. We also rec recognize that while the primary responsibility for combating lead poisoning rests uh, with our government, international organizations play a pivotal role in, the, in this global effort. Georgia has been uh, fortunate to receive substantial support from international entities, partners, friends, such as USAID, UNICEF, WHO, Germany, and the Arctic University of Norway. Uh, this support is directed towards strengthening chemical biomonitoring, building uh, laboratory capacity, establishing surveillance models, uh, developing communication campaigns, and training human resources. Importantly, our active involvement in the European environment and health process uh, showcases our commitment. We were honored to be selected as a co-lead for a new cooperation mechanism uh, among member states, promoting the use, use of human biomonitoring in the WHO European region, led by Germany. And this partnership, dear friends, launched at the seventh ministerial conference on environment and health in 2023, saw us hosting the first meeting in Tbilisi in November 2023. And this gathering uh, brought together members of the par partnership to agree on 
priorities uh, and promote human biomonitoring bio work in the WHO European region. So leveraging these individual, these invaluable, I'm sorry, partnerships, Georgia is steadfast in its commitment to strengthening both human and technical capacities. We aim to further develop our lead surveillance systems, conduct uh, thorough research on sources of lead poisoning, uh, implement effective mitigation strategies, and contribute progressively to the reduction of the burden and lead exposure. Uh, to conclude, the World Economic Forum uh, provides us with a unique opportunity to reinforce and elevate our collective political commitment to a shared vision, a world free of lead poisoning, adopting rigorous monitoring, strict regulations, and fostering international uh, collaboration is Georgia's commitment to addressing lead poisoning comprehensively. And I believe that a united global community, we can achieve greater results, ensuring a healthier and more prosperous future for generations worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister, for sharing the comprehensive approach that you have taken in Georgia, all the way thinking regulation, education, surveillance, <clears throat> leadership commitment, and international collaboration as part of that playbook to, to get to the wonderful results that you have shared. Thank you. Thank you. It is true that lead poisoning is a big and often neglected problem. One of the good news, I think, there's more and more research to help us understand the causes and the interventions that can be put in place to address it. If I may call on you, Mr. Minister Soraga, to comment on sharing your thoughts on how Tanzania has approached managing lead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Lucy, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, Madam Samantha and uh, Prime Minister Bashvili. Apologies if I didn't pronounce the name right. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to be a uh, part of the discussion. I won't take too much of the time. I'll limit myself to maybe two or three minutes. I think most of what has been said I'm in agreement with, and I'm very happy to note that there's a general consensus within the global community that we need to get rid of this harmful chemical substance. And uh, for us, it's critically important as, uh, as a country to note that we are not alone in the fight. Uh, Tanzania has been uh, the champion uh, in terms of uh, putting the right measures of erad eradicating lead uh, within, within the society. Uh, when we, we, we first did this back in 2016, but on that same note, uh, we are also signatories to the uh, uh, Basel Convention of 1999. So uh, we, we have begun uh, this process more than uh, three decades ago in, in terms of uh, recognizing the harmful effects of this substance and taking the right measures uh, to remove it. And uh, it's important, once you note, uh, you know, in, in order to solve a problem, you have to recognize that there is a problem and then try to find the right solutions of uh, addressing uh, that issue. So as I had stated, uh, we have been in the forefront within the region uh, to take measures uh, to, to, to remove lead uh, within, within our society. And uh, I, I don't have to dwell too much on the statistics, but in terms of the broader economic effect on the continent, uh, you look at the numbers, uh, it's, it's costing the continent almost $134 million each year as a result of uh, lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a significant amount of money considering the already, uh, you know, effects uh, that are prevalent, but also the uh, weaknesses within the health system. You know, so it adds or compounds the problem even further because now you have another crisis on top of another crisis that you have to, that you have to address. And uh, so we, we have in place uh, regulatory measures and as we had discussed in our briefing, uh, that is not entirely the issue. The issue is how to enforce, uh, how to have the proper mechanism of enforcing those regulations and making sure that uh, our regulatory bodies have the capacity to be able to uh, identify uh, uh, the, the products that, are, that have led and how to remove them or how, how to uh, expose them. And uh, on the other hand, we uh, are facing difficulties, for example, when it comes to products, uh, for example, that microchips. Uh, 
mm-hmm. where you know we typically when we talk about lead we talk about paints we talk about batteries but you can also find lead in some of these small electronic products and some of them they do have a higher content than the uh, regular uh, requirement and so in, in terms of addressing that and the uh, identifying it and how to remove it uh, that has become a challenge but uh, all in all, our regulatory bodies, uh, which we have plenty, uh, have been doing a wonderful job, first of all, to make sure that in all of our border crossings, uh, ports of entry, that we have the right frameworks uh, to identify if our products have exceeded the uh, limit that is required. And then you have the remaining challenge of the stock that is already in the country. Uh, the previously used batteries or toys and how to uh, make follow up on that and remove what is already in there. So the general outlook from our from our point is uh, to make sure that we continue to uh, engage at the community level, uh, sensitize the community so that they understand to what extent this product has uh, an effect on their health. I think know-how and understanding is very critical in this aspect. And then uh, making sure that we have a collaborative aspect of it, whether it's uh, the private sector, the government, uh, PPP framework, and civil society organizations, of course, have a pivotal role as well to play in terms of sensitization and actually going in uh, at the community level and removing some of these harmful sub- uh, substances. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Soraga. I want to build on this comment that you're making around education, right? Because I think one of the challenges that we see when we think of lead in consumer products, it appears to be a market failure that in some ways is exacerbated by how invisible it may be. We may not know that it is in the cooking pots that are being used to prepare a meal, right? Or, you know, in the makeup that we may be using. And so, how we think about driving the education, the understanding of the sources of materials that are in our products is essential to get to a solution. The good news, as we've said multiple times now, is that we know that there's many interventions already available, and they present a very positive return on investment when we look at them. The thing is, this is a highly fragmented problem. As we think about the solutions, we highlighted that it'll vary significantly market to market. And so it is important to understand that we need to know how concentrated or fragmented a supply chain may be for a particular product in a particular geography, and how easy or difficult it may be to replace it, to substitute it with another product. We know from press experience that in many instances that substitution does not necessarily carry cost implications. Those can be some of the quick wins available. We heard from Administrator Power earlier the positive story of how lead had been removed from gasoline. And that can serve as inspiration as we think about how can we apply that framework to other products. And so, Administrator Power, I would like to call back on you and ask you to elaborate, how do you think about what comes next? As you think about this ambitious vision focused on consumer goods, and where would you like partners to focus? Thank you. Well, I'd be very interested, particularly in hearing um, our Tanzanian colleagues' um, viewpoint on that last question about about you know where to prioritize from the standpoint of one country that's that's making such a substantial effort here. Um, I I would start, I guess, as one does in the development field, with the the data gaps, mm-hmm. um, and that can sound very antiseptic uh, and abstract. But here, what are we talking? We're talking about moving from these aggregated numbers that all of us have used Mm -hmm. to what the Georgian example shows was possible, the ability to generate at a community level insight into what was happening, why it was happening. So that starts with uh, blood level testing, of course. Um, Blood level testing, you know, there are people who are watching, I'm sure, who will uh, forget more about uh, lead than I will ever know, but it's really fascinating the extent to which the testing itself can give you insight into the source of the lead poisoning. Um, So the science is our friend here, uh, but testing at scale uh, is not something that is happening in in the parts of the country that are are suffering the most uh, from what you might refer to as a lead lead crisis. Um, My colleague and I were reflecting uh, before this session about 
about what we've gone through with COVID and the difference in COVID between the early stages, for those of us who were lucky enough to, to get access to testing, um, because many countries didn't until far too late in, into the pandemic, um, but those early tests, you know, having to go away, uh, taking sometimes four or five days, you know, the damage that that would do versus at the end of the pandemic, the rapid tests and then the ability to, to act on that from a policy perspective. I'm only mentioning that because it's fresh in our minds uh, because uh, we've lived the pandemic so recently. But imagine if those kinds of tests, if there was a, uh, a point of care test that was available uh, to kids, you would uh, be able, again, then uh, to know potentially what the sources of the poisoning are, develop a regulatory framework, see if those substitutions are available, um, but also provide care to those who have not yet suffered the developmental uh, impacts that can be severe and can be irreversible if it has gone on too long. So I would say that. I think also you alluded earlier, um, and, and uh, I, I sort of uh, nodded to it as well, the importance of knowing which interventions work. We, we have a lot more that we can learn about cost effectiveness. Um, again, not adjudicated in the abstract, but adjudicated in particular communities that may not have uh, infinite resources to get at all aspects of this problem. Uh, and then last, just a couple comments. Um, we, my remarks emphasize consumer products. Uh, because we agree that there is substantial low-hanging fruit there because those substitutions are available. We, of course, recognize that the industrial processes, the manufacturing, the mining, improper recycling, uh, you know, scrap metal in a manner that turns up then in pots, you know, as, as uh, our Tanzanian colleague described, um, you know, where lead is already present in communities, uh, diagnosing it, but then the cost of removal, behavior change, normative change, I mean, none of this comes easy, but I, I, I really want to come back to just how little has been invested and how quickly we collectively could see a return on investment if we concentrated, um, you know, even by tripling this paltry uh, amount of development resources, you would already start to see lives saved and developmental, negative developmental impacts uh, avoided. Very last comment is just to link, as, as uh, Tanzania has this issue to all the other development um, challenges and opportunities that exist out there. You know, when USAID uh, does a lot in the nutrition space, including it with, uh, with our Tanzanian colleagues and in Tanzanian communities, um, you know, calcium and iron deficiencies increase lead absorption. So, you know, uh, for those countries uh, that, you know, are working in other sectors and haven't yet budgeted for lead per se, there are still synergies that we can achieve together by concentrating resources across the spectrum of development uh, interventions. And here, too, the debt crisis that is befalling so many countries, you know, puts countries that would really like to tackle this challenge and, and have now new data made available and success stories like the Georgian example or new regulatory frameworks, the um, fiscal space has been shrunk significantly. So, you know, supporting countries uh, responsibly manage their debt and, and responsible renegotiation of that debt will be really important for the investments that the countries themselves want to be making uh, in saving lives and avoiding these developmental harms. Thank you. I realize we have time now. I'll turn it over to our audience um, to see if there's any questions that they may want to share with the three of you. Any questions from the audience? Everything's clear. <laughs> well, I still have a few questions, so <laughs> if so, um, I may actually Maybe, um, Minister Saraga, if I'll start with you. As you think about the changes and the investments that are required, how would you describe what additional help would be helpful to countries like Tanzania to address the lead challenge? I, th I think uh, from a capacity building standpoint, that's one area where we need to focus. And uh, the use of technology, I, th I think, when you look at the regulatory bodies that are uh, in charge, of uh, oversight, the 
technology is outdated, so it's much, it's it's very easy for whether it's manufacturers or importers to, uh, you know, go around the system without being recognized because of the outdated technology. And then on the other hand, uh, within ourselves, uh, we, we need to have uh, a clear uh, communication framework. Like I said before, we have too many agencies uh, tasked to do uh, the same task, but oftentimes they come out with different outcomes. And uh, in terms of standardization, you know, you have the local standards and then you have the regional standards, let's say the East African community in SADC, where in one region the accepted standard is uh, this, and then within the country it's probably much lower. So we, we need to kind of harmonize that and come into an agreement. What What is the accepted level uh, if it's uh, accepted to be able to come in into mm -hmm. the country? Uh, I think it's very important and it's something that we haven't really had a, a, a broader discussion on. And uh, you, you have examples where, you know, agencies are clashing and uh, their business decisions, of course, it's investment and it's uh, money that is involved. And uh, if, 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 if the regulatory agencies are not speaking the same language, what does it leave? Room for corruption and people, you know, going under the table and making decisions that can impact uh, public health uh, in, in general. And then I uh, uh, think, you know, to have uh, systems in place, uh, digitization mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the entire process so that we can have a, a proper database of what has been done so far, uh, what, is, what, what else is out there and how we can do it so that we can have tangible measures of the progress that we're making and successes that we're achieving. Uh, I think right now most of the time we're, you know, it's just random sampling, you know, okay, let's go here, let's go there, but it's not a coordinated aspect of, uh, there's, there's a lack of that cohesion in terms of uh, the coordination. So if we, if we digitize, if we build capacity, if we use technology, uh, of course, and then we increase awareness within the community uh, from a public uh, standpoint, that will go much, much further uh, to the grassroots level, of course, because then you have public awareness of uh, what this poison uh, can do to, uh, to the communities. Thank you for sharing that. It's important to emphasize that interconnectivity that exists, right? Whether you're talking about how interconnected the supply chains, the regulators, right? And the criticality of bringing all that together. I see a question from the audience. Great. After my remarks. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Perez. Um, could you please elaborate on how the private sector can engage and maybe illustrate some uh, stories of success that you want to highlight right now? I'm happy to, and I'm sure there may be some other examples from individual countries that others would like to highlight. But indeed, what we see, and one can go all the way back to looking at that example in the gasoline space, right? Where, for example, oil companies, actually even before the mandate to eliminate lead came into being, were already taking action to remove lead because there was that understanding of the unfortunate impacts, outrageous impacts on human health, one may say. And so there are stories, for example, when we look at the impact from lead in paint, of companies that were educated, understood the, the impact that the lead in their products would have as administrator power reference. The children, they were thinking about if it were their own children living in houses where it was that paint on the walls, what would be the difference? And actually leaned into that as a value proposition that then they used to communicate to their own customers the importance of having products that were lead free. Um, in this particular example that I'm thinking of, in this market, that company actually became a market leader as a result of leaning into a value proposition of lead-free products that really resonated with the consumer. Because maybe to the point that I made earlier, a lot of the challenge that we have in this space is that invisibility of like not understanding what's in the products and also not understanding those deleterious effects that it will have on human health. Because oftentimes, as we've heard from the panelists, these effects take too long to manifest to make the connection between the source and the impact. But if I may turn it over, any particular stories of roles that you have seen the private sector play in your countries that you would like to call out? Yes. Okay, so we, we have uh, three uh, major uh, manufacturers of, of paint uh, in, in the country. 
and uh, of course they are notorious in terms of, uh, and I, I won't mention names, but they're <laughs> notorious in terms of the excess amount of lead that was uh, in, in them. But the good thing about our, our case is that, uh, you know, a, a dialogue, uh, honest engagement, and uh, really just showing uh, that, okay, the government is serious on this and we, we are not playing around. We guys, you need to review your standards. You need to review uh, the uh, amount of lead that is in your paints. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna come and shut you down. So at least in that aspect, uh, we, we have been able to get that messaging across to them and for them to understand where we are coming from and uh, the, the, the community, the, the health crisis that is uh, prevalent. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy at times because uh, be because of the lack of awareness and uh, the health impact of it, it's something that it's not visible. You know, it's, it's not something that you see outright. Okay, this is the, the effect and it's long term. So it, to, to get people on board to show that you, uh, that this is a public health crisis, it, it takes a lot of convincing. But we, we, we're happy to note that these companies have uh, really been uh, champions now for us and uh, they're leading the example. The main issue now is for uh, the traders who are importing. And uh, so you can see this clash between manufacturers and traders and uh, it hasn't been a very good success story from the, from the trading side, from the trader side. Prime Minister, anything to add from Georgia's perspective? Oh, I think uh, I already explained the whole story. So. Yeah. <coughs> right. Um, if there's no other questions from the audience, oh, I'm sorry, Minister sorry, Power, anything else to well, add on I, the role of the private sector? I would just yes. underscore, I think, the yes. point mm -hmm. that, that uh, you have made and that, that has come up, but just, you know, it used to be that the incentives um, cut the other way, you know, cut against public health. Um, and, you know, this is a very broad topic and there are lots of sources of lead out there and, and there will be some for, 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 for which this is not the case. But by and large, you now see uh, alternatives that companies can employ uh, that offer similar properties at competitive price points. And so, I don't know, you, you didn't share the, the punchline, uh, Mr. Minister, about whether those companies now have, have made those adjustments yet or in, in, in trained to doing so. Um, but w this is not a call to impose huge new price burdens uh, on the providers of really important consumer products in developing countries. Um, it, it is, I think the, the, the point that has come across is because not only is it, it this is, it, there's a double invisibility here. Mm -hmm. There's an invisibility to how lead poisoning occurs, uh, an invisibility, you know, people aren't coughing as they mm -hmm. would if they, you know, have the flu. They don't show symptoms as they would if they have malaria. Um, so it's actually invisible in the people who are being afflicted. Um, but also this issue globally, I'm pretty sure this is the first lead-related event, for example, at the World Economic Forum, and thanks to the organizers for letting us do this, but, but the problem is invisible, and the fact that these solutions are available is far less visible uh, than it needs to be. And, and I thought the minister put it so well and brought us home, you know, down to the community level. I mean, if parents knew what their kids were being exposed to, what those products were, you can bet that that example that you offered of the gas companies self-regulating, mm -hmm. that you would start to see, uh, you know, consumer product providers themselves, you know, digging deep and, and not trying to bypass a regulatory system, but indeed to embrace it because the, con the, the cost to, to trust with the consumer would ultimately affect the mm -hmm. bottom line. So more awareness, more leadership, more joining uh, what we hope will be an ever-expanding coalition, I think can really help us uh, show results of very quickly. Yes, maybe to close and build on that note, Administrator Power, this is clearly like you very elegantly set up at the beginning, the scale of the challenge, let's say, but at the same time, the scale of the opportunity, right? I think we should celebrate that we know so much more now. We know those interventions that are likely to work. Many, like you said, come with incredibly positive returns on investment. And so really a time to take action. And hopefully this Global Alliance is part of that, catalyzing the action to really lead to a healthier world. 
where lead is not causing the deleterious effects on human health that we have been seeing to date. On that note, let me thank all three of our panelists for sharing your lessons learned and uh, participating in this very important conversation today. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you.